Hello again, my friends. It's me. Thanks so much for coming again. Tonight's offering is a fan art of Hermes from Futurama, who has been afflicted or has been liberated by a brain slug. I say could have been liberated because it certainly seems like something the brain slug would say. It's going to be a good night, y'all. Get comfortable. So this might come to as a shock to some, but I watch a lot of cartoons with my daughter. The daughter you may be able to hear on occasion talking loudly in the background. She's uh, in the bedroom, and it sounds like her her Barbies are in the middle of some kind of battle or something. Uh, she should be sleeping, but what's she gonna do? It's it's just too cute to hear her play. Anyhow, we watch uh, a lot of cartoons together. And one of her favorites is Futurama, which is convenient because it's one of my favorites. Now, for people who've been listening to the show for a while, or uh, have been seeing kind of the things that I like to draw, you'll know that I have a, a, a certain love of drawing round shapes, which translates very often into pudgy people. And Hermes from Futurama is just the perfect subject for a guy like me. There's that beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, line that Fry has at one point in the series where uh, Hermes says that he's Jamaican for the first time, and Fry says, You're Jamaican? I thought you were some kind of strange space potato or something. And, oh, that was perfect. I died laughing. I die laughing every time I hear that line because I'm cheesy. But, uh, yep, pudgy Hermes is where it's at. So I'm watching... uh, I'm watching Futurama with my girl, and it uh, comes to the first time we see the brain slug. Uh, Hermes comes in looking much like uh, the face that I've got drawn there. It says, Hermes had a fun time in the brain slug nebula. Here, everyone, I got you these hats. And uh, lately I've been thinking long and hard about simple cartoon forms, like much, much simpler, much easier... Uh, styles of rendering uh, characters and character information. Uh, I've mentioned them before. I mention them pretty much every episode. Um, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, regular show. Uh, there's more examples, I'm sure. Um, Adventure Time, even though I don't really watch it. So anyway, what's happening is I find myself becoming jealous of these very simplified two-dimensional shapely cartoon forms. Ooh, examples I forgot. Dexter's Lab, Powerpuff Girls, Samurai Jack. All wonderful, wonderful, wonderful examples of character and set designs that are shape-based. Everything is very fun shapes, but nothing's really a form. Nothing's really all that three-dimensional. And so... I'm, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of the people who work in this art style. And I want to work in it as well, but there's something in me that kind of keeps it from happening. Just when when the time comes to put the pencil in my hand and to start doing the work, it doesn't come out that way. And uh, I can lament this fact, and I can start forcing myself to draw only in the cartoon modern style. To start forcing myself to make everything look like it came out of regular show, Dexter's Lab, that sort of thing. Or, I can try to translate those things into whatever comes naturally out of my hand. I was splitting a table at a convention with with a buddy of mine named uh, Max Miller Dowdle. Uh, You you may have heard me mention him. Uh, Great guy. And uh, he is by trade. He's actually a fine artist. Uh, He's a painter. And uh, he makes most of his money, um, when last we spoke, from portraits. And he posts some sketches on Facebook, and I say sketches very loosely because they are gorgeous, gorgeous drawings that look look like photographs, only more interesting and more flattering. Really beautiful stuff, and I'm looking at his work and I am just seething with terrible jealousy. How can this guy do that? I wish I could draw like this guy. I just can't do it. This guy's too good. Ivy, what are you doing, baby? Hold on. So anyway, he's got this he's got this command with any art utensil that he uses that is 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 beautiful and perfect and exact and wonderful and, and I can't do it and I ah oh, so I'm silently just 
seething at this guy. How can he be so good? And I, I, uh, I can't seem to break out of this little cartoony box that I've cultivated for myself. And so anyway, we're tabling next to each other. And he's kind of flipping through one of my books and he says, Man, look, look at these. I can't do this. This cartoony stuff right here, I can't, I can't draw cartoony. Every time I do, it ends up looking like a photograph. For some reason, and he, like I wanna, I wanna draw cartoony. That's why I started making comics. But every time I sit down with a pencil in my hand, the same stuff keeps coming out. And this was a beautiful epiphany moment. He's jealous of me. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not. You know, he, he might be. Uh, maybe a little? I don't know. It seems strange and foreign, but just for the sake of the argument, just for the sake of, of the point that I'm trying to make, he's jealous of me and my cartoon nonsense? Really? In the face of his beautiful, beautiful hand-drawn renderings. And what it comes down to is that, uh, in art, much like in life, we all have our parts to play. We all have ways that the pencil, the pen, the brush, the chalk, we have ways that all of these things will just move in our hands. And when you try to fight that, the results are not always good. In fact, the results are usually very destructive and full of disappointment. Uh, and I can, I can give you examples of how that happens in life, but let's, let's focus on art for now. Um, something that I really enjoy is, uh, Max's drawings. Um, I enjoy Max's drawings a whole lot because they're, they're so beautiful and so well done, and, and it's just, wow, a human can do this. But, I don't always want to draw that way. Um, the same way that I would look at a very, very stiff... Uh, vector rendering of of a cartoon character or scene. I I can I can appreciate it. It looks great, and I'm I am my life is enriched because I have I have seen this thing. I've experienced this art, but I don't necessarily want to make it myself. I don't want to have to go through what I'd have to go through to make it myself. And just the fact that somebody else is making something different helps to enrich me in a, in a big, bad way that's really important. Now, I'm, I, emotionally right now, I'm, I'm flying pretty high because um, just recently I, I went to a, a local um, concert festival here in Raleigh called Hopscotch, which is uh, uh, it's, it's becoming an increasingly big deal. And something that's really cool about Hopscotch is uh, the statistic is something like 43% or so of the bands at this festival are homegrown. They're either from here in the Triangle or they're from somewhere in North Carolina. And I'm a big fan of that. Uh, also, uh, one of the headlining bands is Mastodon, which is awesome. Just so good. There's Other headliners were, were really good too. Valiant Thor comes to mind. Anyhow, um, for those of you who know me, like uh, I'm, I'm also a musician. My, my lead instrument is drums. And, um, like anyone who plays drums and wants to play them very, very well and wants to be creative, uh, my favorite musical genre is, uh, the progressive stuff and heavy metal. I love the metal. Big, big fan of the metal. And so, Mastodon. Ah, oh, Mastodon's so good. But, you see, the trick is, uh, most of the bands at this festival are very small bands. Almost all of them are are, are pretty pretty unknown, and um, they're uh, they they fit uh, uh, this very big broad genre called indie rock. Just a uh, bunch of weird weird music by people who, with uh, varying degrees of of skill and talent, and uh, I enjoyed it a whole lot because uh, the more time goes on. You know, drawing, especially comics and this sort of thing, it's very, very solitary. When you're making it, it's very solitary. So it's a lot of me just kind of being stuck in my room with with uh, my drawing supplies. And so I went to this concert. I, I went to all of the free day shows because I ain't got no money. But uh, I went to all of these little concerts, and I got such a charge, such a thrill. 
uh, I'm watching a band. I was watching one band. I can't remember their name to save my life, but they sucked. They sucked so hard. They sucked out loud. And I do mean loud. But I was having so much fun. I enjoyed being there. If nothing else, it's like those three people or those five or those seven people uh, that I saw a couple different bands um, of, of varying quality. All of these people got together and they're making something new and they're trying really hard and they're really putting themselves into it the way that I do with my comics, the way that all of my comic friends are doing it with their work, the way that uh, all of my artist friends are working hard on their art. And these guys are really, really trying and they're making something new. And that, first of all, is beautiful. Second of all, it's very affirming to me. Somebody else is trying something new and is working very hard at it. And they're also meeting with varying levels of quality and success. And that that variety is part of what makes it so enriching. The uh the uh this is my this is uh um gonna sound hippie and weird, but the bands who are who 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 play terrible music add as much uh, uh, quality to the overall experience as the bands who played beautifully, just because uh, the variety is there, because you you get to you get to see it happen. It's it's kind of the difference between um, seeing comedy live and seeing comedy in uh, Comedy Central uh, Comedy Central specials. What you see in the special has been um, sterilized. You don't see the jokes that didn't make it, you don't hear them experiment, and you don't really get to feel the interaction with the audience. Uh, so, so I'm off on a tangent here, I better wrap it around. So what happens is, you're not getting the full, full effect, whereas if you see a comedy show live, you get the full effect, you get, you get kind of closer, you get to see what's actually going on, you get to feel the vibe in the room, uh, the jokes that hit are much funnier, and the jokes that miss make the overall show better just because you're kind of there with the comedian. Uh, Mitch Hedberg was especially good at uh, when one of his jokes missed. He said, ah, damn it, that, ju that, that joke didn't go over so well. And the fact that he's willing to say it out loud on a microphone in front of an audience made it so much better and it kept all the tension out of the room. Uh, and so bringing it back to visual art, um, I'm doing what I can do. And not everybody can do this. There are many artists who are better than me. Uh, there are many, many artists who are better than me. And there's many artists who are not as good as I am at, at what they do specifically. But nobody draws exactly like I do. Uh, lots of people draw similarly, uh, particularly the people that, that are directly influencing me. Um, uh, uh, Scotty Young, Robbie Rodriguez, and... Um, Rob Momarts are my, my biggest influences at this exact second. But nothing is exactly like me. So when I look at my art and I think, man, I wish I had a cleaner style. I wish I had fewer lines. I wish I had more emphasis on shape. You know, these are things that I can do. These are things that I can work on if I want to. But at the same time, I need to think. People that I regard as, as being well on their way to true mastery, people like Max look at my artwork and say, I can't do that. This looks really good. I get a charge out of this. I don't necessarily want all of my art to look like it, but I get a charge that this exists. And also, I get a charge that this exists because I can't do that specifically. The same way that I can't make paintings the way that Max can. And so what it all comes down to is in any art that you're doing, we all have kind of a role to play. We all have something that we're supposed to do. And it is in this way that we all have a voice. And so that's, again, coming right back around to why this video podcast is being made, finding your voice. That's, that's the point. Um, we all have a part to play, and we'll play our part best when we understand our part best, and we understand it by finding what our voice is, and also by forging what our voice is, by working hard on it. Uh, and so that's what, A, this video podcast is about, and B, what this drawing you're looking at is. So you know what? We've been staring at it for a while. Why don't we talk about this drawing for a second? So I'm sitting down, I'm watching Futurama, and I'm, uh, I'm 
watching the episode where Hermes has a brain slug. And in my head, I think, well, there's Hermes. I would love to draw Hermes because he's a, he's a big round potato man. So perfect. Uh, followed by there's a brain slug, which I think is a hilarious joke. And I'm, 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 I don't know why I'm a sucker for Futurama jokes. I don't think they're that good, but I just, I, I love them anyway. And I love the idea of the brain slug. There's just so much funny that can be done with brain slugs and they, they do some of it. And, What's really getting me is Hermes is more or less a simple character because it's in the, that Matt Groening style, you know what I mean? But the brain slug is super, super simple because the brain slug, as it appears on the show, is just uh, a semicircle with vague round bits that may or may not be tentacles and uh, a circle eye in the middle uh, and, and two antennae. It's, it's one of the most simplified things that they could draw is what I'm getting at. And I'm really, really attracted to simplified shapes. And, and, and the thought occurred to me, what would it be like if I drew that? What if I take this concept of Hermes and this brain slug and um, the description that you'd write down on paper, uh, you know, one eye, uh, tentacles, um, antenna, more or less round, uh, and attached to a head? What what would this character design look like through the filter of my own pen? What, uh, so this is one of those moments where uh, two things are happening. One, uh, I'm finding more about what my voice is, what the way that I want to do things. And two, uh, I'm also kind of indulging something. If you look at the first brain slug that, that's on Hermes' head, look at all of the tiny little black lines around its eye. I'm, I'm, uh, and, and if you can, look at Hermes Dreadlock. See how it's not all flat and black, uh, which is something that I'd usually do. What's happening here is, is I've got just a natural propensity to kind of doodle a little bit. Once the actual drawing is put down, then to go back and just make marks just for making marks, just because I want to. I'm like, yeah, it looks like something should go here. And that's actually kind of uh, a sign of a weak novice in terms of in terms of making art. So way back when, when I noticed that I did this, and I put a lot of scribbles and a lot of hatching where it really shouldn't go because that's something you should use to judiciously, and I was far too liberal with it, uh, I, I would leave it all out, but my drawings would still look just so naked and terrible without it, so I, I had to find a middle ground, and that's when I started moving to gray markers. Um, the middle ground was adding rendering to my drawings, and that put some life back into what was otherwise very stale inks. But that was years ago, and lately I've become so much more um, comfortable with, with uh, penciling nice and loose, and then keeping the life into the drawing while the inks are going on top, kind of like letting the inks uh, inject life uh, into the drawing. Because something that happens to so many people is that uh, the pencil drawing looks nice, and then you put on inks, and uh, a lot of the life and a lot of the energy is taken out of the whole situation. <clears throat> And a, a great ambition for most most artists when they hit this middle point is to find a way to keep the life in the drawings, uh, even with the inks there. And so that's just kind of what I'm doing right now. It's just just flat ink, no grays, and see what happens. And and I'm pretty happy with the result. There's a lot more lines, a lot more marks. Like if you could see some of the hatching and excuse me, in a Hermes shoulder thing that they have in. I don't know, Futurama fashion is weird. But that, that, that shoulder thing on Hermes, there's some extra hatching in there that really shouldn't have been there. I should have, uh, I should have either made that flat black or I should have just left it alone. Hatching didn't belong there. But everywhere else where you're seeing little, little lines, um, it works. Something else that's happening is uh, I like super bold black lines, but I, lately I'm starting to back off them a little bit. Uh, I don't want every line to be so bold. I really want to lighten up my hand and get delicate. And I'm starting to get to the point where I want my lines to be more delicate than my uh, my most trusty brush pen can produce. So I'm starting to use my super fine or my regular fine tip zebra brush pen a little bit more to get some of the some of the little lines out the the way that I like. Um, so this, the whole exercise here is, uh, A, kind of see where I'm at right now, um, in terms of, of, uh, what, what my natural style is becoming. Uh, and so see what, what, uh, an already tried and true convention that we've all seen visually, uh, looks like when it's translated through my own pen. 
Item number two, and this is the second part of finding your voice, is deciding what your voice is. It's being an active participant in what your voice is supposed to be. Uh, so often I hear the phrase, find myself, and I, I, I have never liked this phrase because, uh, especially growing up, it's like, well, I looked in the mirror, there I am, well, hey, I'm found. And uh, especially as a young person, what, what I should have heard was make yourself, forge yourself, cultivate yourself, turn yourself into something that you want to be. In essence, we can all be Batman. Uh, we can all forge ourselves into the person that we want to be by working hard and then by doing the thing that we say we want to do. Uh, and part of, part of that is um, I want to redesign the brain slug. I want to, I want to, it's such a, it, it's such a fun challenge uh, because it's so simple. It's, it's a spherical head. It's got tentacles. It's got one eye and it's got two antennas. How many different ways are there to draw that? And I came up with, um, the the main one on Hermes' head plus two more, and I'm proud of of all four brain slugs, and I like them a whole lot. Uh, I don't necessarily have a favorite, but it just there it is. I want to find a way to make myself into a better artist that way. Now, something I mentioned a little bit earlier was notice how all the dreadlocks. You can't because it's not. Oh, there it is on screen. Uh, Hermes dreadlocks. They're not flat black. This is something that I'm trying. This is part of the, uh, uh, this is part of the I'm making myself do this situation. There's, there's this, uh, uh, artistic theory or principle that I've heard that, uh, uh, don't make your spot blacks spot black. Don't do it. What you should do instead is make them sketchy black, leave like little pinholes of white, because somehow that makes the black space richer, makes it more more visually appealing, makes it more interesting. It's something that your eye can linger on a little bit longer. And that's the theory. Me personally, I love flat black. I love it flat, I love it black, and I like to know where all the lines are, and that's part of what attracted me to this art form in the first place. Lines and knowing where they go and where they don't. Big, big fan of all of these things. But, how can you really know whether or not something works for you if you don't try it? So, with this Hermes, I forced myself, this spot black is not going to be spotted black, I'm just going to leave some sketchy pinholes. And I've been doing that in a couple other of the drawings that you may not see in this video series. Um, so that's part two, is, is not just find yourself, but forge yourself. Force yourself to do the things that you wouldn't necessarily do on your own. Uh, for instance, like part of this is also just getting comfortable with the fact that I don't draw the way that I admire in other artists. But something that I'm going to do uh, when when I get when I when I get the proper bug up my butt, something I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down and I'm going to draw Mordecai and Rigby and all those guys in the cartoon modern style to get used to that. But in the meantime, here's Hermie. Here's some brain slugs. All right. Uh, so that's all I've got for y'all tonight. I hope this helped. Uh, in the meantime, um, take care of yourself. Take care of each other and make some art. Good night.